Vietnam. Really? Huh. That would almost make it worth it. Yeah, it really does. Almost be. <laughs> okay, strong. Well, welcome everyone. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as uh, I'm sure you're all aware, we're here for a uh, oral dissertation defense, which is the culmination of a uh, doctoral degree. So we're always very excited to uh, get to this phase. Um, John Sires is our candidate for uh, today, and you see the uh, title up on the screen. Uh, you also might have seen, I mentioned earlier, uh, and I put a couple copies around, uh, sort of the structure that we laid out. We just got through the first part, which is the committee talks about like baseball and that whole, you know, you heard about that basketball thing and the Greek stock market. So we've covered those topics, everything's cool. Um, and now we go into the public uh, oral uh, component. And the way this is geared is, um, for uh, what you might call a, an educated lay audience, so so John is going to attempt to, to sort of lay out, uh, you know, the um, the basis and the the, uh, the findings of the uh, dissertation. Um, at the conclusion of that, which we estimate will be around 40 minutes, uh, there'll be uh, some time for questions from anyone who uh, who's attending here. And then after that, again, we'll we'll kick the folks out, keep John this time, and uh, and proceed with the uh, uh, the executive session, the committee session of the. Uh, so that's the basic structure that we have. Um, and if you have uh, questions as, as we're going that seem to be very pertinent to like a particular slide, a little detail, like you know you can't read a word, you can't read a symbol, uh, you're asking what you know the axes are, or, or to repeat something, uh, please go ahead and interject. If that's definitely fine to do. Um, probably for the more conceptual questions, the broader questions, those will be better to wait until the uh, until the end. Okay, everyone, good questions, comments. Concerns? We have cookies. I notice the black ones are a favorite. <laughs> we have a couple of the yellow ones. Too. Um, yeah, I like the yellow ones too. Okay, go ahead and take it away, John. Okie dokie. Um, my name is John Steyers, and I'll be talking about a study of magnetosphere, atmosphere coupling, and atmospheric heat. Okay. Um, the sun is the source of virtually all energy on our planet. And this energy that we get the sun breaks down into two major components. We get the continuous electromagnetic radiation, um, which is a whole zoo. We have visible light, which we're familiar with, and UV, but there's a whole zoo of that. And we also get uh, solar wind plasma, which is continuously radiated off the sun. And this solar wind plasma um, carries with it a frozen in magnetic field. This is a condition in some ways similar to a superconductor, but not analogous because superconductors will expel a magnetic field. Why as um, the solar wind, it's the collisions in the in the, um, the solar wind plasma are so low that it's essentially collisionless. It's uh, it carries a magnetic field with it. Now roughly ten percent of the energy we get from our sun comes from the solar wind and the rest from the electromagnetic our Earth here is a big dipole magnet in space, and the interaction with the solar wind, both the kinetic energy that it carries, which is in the most cases the majority energy, and the interaction with the magnetic field that is carried by the solar wind, it stretches out the Earth's magnetic field, forming the magnetosphere, and then way out here is uh, the magnetic tail, which can be quite long. And then from the daytime bombardment of solar radiation down right around here, we get a region where the, so where the collisions are low enough that the ionization builds up to the point that we have in an ionosphere. Okay, now the coupling between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere is a very, is a rather, com is a complicated process and um, we're going to talk about that for a bit. Uh, it's a coupled system. A change in any one part of the system will affect the other parts. A change in the magnetic convection, for instance, will change the electric field mapping to the ionosphere. The ionospheric current flow will thus change due to uh, electric field through Ohm's law of the electron equation motion. And current continuity requires field line currents close at the bottom of the ionosphere, which will alter the magnetic distribution. One cannot change one part of the system without affecting the other parts. It's a coupled system. And of utmost, or no, I won't say utmost, but of great importance are outband waves, which are the primary means of communication between the various areas in the coupled system. 
and it's also the speed at which information will flow in the system. Okay, we're going to talk about the motivation. Uh, we're going to be looking at discrete aurora. Now, here in Fairbanks, all you guys have seen discrete aurora. They're the curtains of light in the sky. And if you get to catch them on honor in a solar corona, you can see that they're quite thin and sometimes they're dancing. But we're looking at that species of aurora, which is different from the diffuse aurora, which is what you usually see if you look up and look further south, you'll see those bands of diffuse green. We're looking at the discrete aurora, the curtains. Um, the formation and time and evolution of discrete arcs is one of the outstanding mysteries of space physics. Uh, some of the properties are very, they're very thin, uh, I wrote as small as 100 meters, but down below 70 meters have, are extant, they've been, they've been uh, observed. Uh, there's velocity shear in the region of the bottom of the arcs, anti-parallel velocity shear, and there are electric fields radiating out perpendicularly from the bottom of the arc. We're also going to look at um, one of the components of the deposition of energy in the auroral zone in the region of these small-scale discrete aurora structures. Uh, the majority of this energy is deposited in the auroral zone and is in the form of dual heating. This is an appreciable and global in the MI-coupled system. And worth mentioning is that the methodology of investigation is a computer simulation. Okay, I trimmed these way down because it was too much. <laughs> these, are the, these are the important terms from the momentum equation. We use a, a not quite standard three fluid iron electron neutrals model. And I kept this part because this is critical. This is the part of the momentum equation and the inertial terms because we need inertia in order to model alpha and beta. We'll talk a bit more about this. But this is the important part of the equation, so I saved this and I trimmed the rest because it was just too much. <laughs> okay, the model assumes quasi neutrality. This is to avoid oscillations of, on the plasma scale, which are very fast. Uh, if we were to attempt to resolve these types of oscillations, we wouldn't be able to model the, a system of this size, even with modern computational resources, it would be just too great. So, among other things, this model cannot produce by invert waves. Um, the rationale for this is that the divide length is very small. Uh, it has full three-dimensional dynamics, uh, resolution between 100 meters to several kilometers. The domain, um, Altitude of 90 to 100 kilometers can run it lower, but it doesn't get very interesting, to several thousand kilometers, a uh, couple of Earth radii. Uh, horizontal coverage on the order of 100 square kilometers. Now, this is important. We are we're, uh, coupled partial differential equations, but the equations are explicit parabolic equations, although there are such some parabolic terms, uh, but we don't think they're important enough to cause too many problems. Um, we have real characteristics, so, okay, what's a characteristic? This means that the time rate of change, of flow of quantities in the model is finite. There are no instantaneous changes across the model, um, i.e. waves. So this lends itself to parallelization. We can split the, par we can split the computer domain over multiple processors because there are no instantaneous changes over the entire simulation size. Um, the inclusion of the inertial terms in the momentum equation that allows for simulation of the alpha waves. That's, his, uh, that's the most important part of it. Okay, let's talk a bit about alpha waves. Um, consider a, a magnetic field line like a guitar string. If you were to pluck it, it would resonate. And the thing is, we're, we're resonating these guitar strings, so to speak, in a very special gel. And the special gel is in the form of charged particles. Uh, the magnetic field lines will only see charged particles. They won't see uncharged particles. And if you do a bit of math, you can come out like this. And you get this speed. And uh, this little bit of math is the only Nobel in our field. <laughs> and if you get to the region of the absence of the gel, then these will travel at the speed of light which they do. They travel at the bottom of this, the simulation cell into the floor of the Earth. Okay, as I mentioned before, the alpha waves are the rate of information propagation in the system. They are of critical importance. They are means of which information is communicated in the coupled MI system. 
And this is an idealized picture of a shear applied at the top of the simulation domain to spawn alpha rays traveling down into the system. Okay, now, to document that we're actually talking about alpha waves that we see generated from the top of the system, we're using something called the wave emulation, which I misspelled, and I forgot the anyway, um, <laughs> If the ratio of the magnetic perturbations over the gu guide field, these travel along field lines, um, is equal to plus or minus, they can travel in other direction, the velocity perturbations over the alpha speed, then one knows this one's dealing with an alpha this is called the wave emulation. And we can see we've got a wave coming down here on this side of the parent sheet. And with our scale here, we can tell this white region, this is an alpine wave. So we're just documenting that we are looking at alpine waves. OK. Now, a um, little bit of background on this. These are slices, even time steps apart. Uh, 7.5 alphane times apart. We're looking from up to 17,500 kilometers down to zero. Zero is not true zero. It's the bottom of the ionosphere. It's about 100 kilometers off the, the simulation is zero. And we're looking at a slice uh, looks like 16 kilometers wide in X. And there's a couple of things going out here. Um, one, that, one was an alphane time. An alphane time is defined as the distance that travels over the vertical length scale. It's around a tenth of a second. Um, and these color codes are the velocity scale, and we have some lines on here to show the direction. And there are a couple of things I want to talk here about. Here we can see the alphane wave coming down, coming down, coming down. And what happens down here is the concentration of the neutrals grows so high that the collisions with the neutrals get so great that the charged particles can no longer move. So you lose your gel, and the product is partially reflected and partially transmitted out of the bottom of the simulation. Uh, this here and this spawning up here the velocity shear of the simulation is a non-equilibrium situation. So the plasma has to respond to try and equalize the non-equilibrium and the only way it can do this is by moving because B is equal to V cross E, or E is equal to V cross B, yeah. And so you can see this one traveling up, but it gets swamped by the other wave. Now this here, right about one Earth radii, is interaction with the reconnection region of the and, oh yes, in the, old, in the original boundary condition, this wasn't very realistic because magnetic perturbations could just flow right out the bottom of the, um, the simulation, so currents didn't flow as properly. So we added new boundary conditions, and the way we did this was we set the magnetic field in X and the magnetic field in Y um, equal to uh, zero. And this gave us a realistic conduct, well, somewhat realistic conductivity of the um, of the Pedersen conductivity so the currents can close to the side. Now you'll see you'll see a couple of interesting things here that didn't happen before. One, you get this alpha wave spawned up coming up from the bottom. And this is a result of having a uh, more realistic current closure in the bottom. Or this is a result of having a real more realistic person. And it bounces off the top and comes back down. And again you see this interaction with this region right here. All right, let's talk a bit about the simulation domain. Um, we have an imposed current shear from the front going down and from the back going down. Now, we chose our simulation domain because it's large enough to see the phenomena and small enough to be realistically modeled. I don't think I'll ever forget as long as I live when you said most models are too good to be true or too true to be good. I will never forget that. <laughs> Then we um, impose a region of local resistivity, and this forms a reconnection region. Um, some people might be troubled by the term reconnection. In the ionosphere, they call it friction. Um, the nomenclature for reconnection is out of scope of this talk. <laughs> and what you have is you have the destruction of the identity of these field lines. The front ones lose their identity and become coupled with the rear ones. And the rear ones lose their identity and become coupled with the front ones. 
And the progressive reconnection of these lines and moving outward from the reconnection region is what spreads the discrete arc. Fascinating idea. And these are just the alpha waves traveling down, reflecting, and then you have a superposition, superposition and that's what the color codes mean. And these, this is showing an idealized view. The reconnection happens here, spawns an alpha wave, comes down, reflects, and comes out. The reason they're traveling out is these waves are continuously coming in, fed by the velocity shear at the top, reconnecting and coming out again. Um, and successive LFA waves map through this reconnection region. Okay. The magnetic shear produces a current sheet. Anytime you have a net curl of a magnetic field, you're going to produce a current. It's uh, J is equal to 1 over mu naught del cross B. Um, so this produces a current sheet. And we're going to show the successive deformation of current sheet for boundary conditions A and boundary conditions B if everything works. I imagined I would be the first person to ever show their um, something on a PhD thesis through YouTube, but uh, Dr. Newby assures me that I'm not. <laughs> You did, you can just hit visitor to log in required. Okay, where are we at here? Um, just go down to the purple box at the bottom. Okay. I just had this, this nagging feeling in the back of my head that something was going to go wrong. <laughs> things here. I'm going to run this more slowly because it's just it's too fast. Right here we see the deformation of the current sheet as a result of the reconnection region forming. And it spawns out alpha waves and deforms this current sheet. And then we'll subsequently see it flow down one side and partway up the other. Now for scale, this is about two-thirds of the size in height of the previous one I showed you. And it's the same directions horizontally. And here's what happens when you turn on realistic better semiconductors. Works identical, but then you develop forms, deformations of this current sheet that are actually reminiscent, I missed it, but anyway, of um, actually look visually like Aurora. And we're trying to think of a more sophisticated way to say that, and I can't, it just looks like Aurora. Okay, now the point I wanted to show with that was the realistic pedoscopic conductivity slash closure of currents in the atmosphere leads to conditions which resemble actual work. Now, here are some, here are some realistic features of the world arcs right here. This is a cut at the bottom of the simulation domain. Um, This is a realistic Pedersen conductivity. And we get some extraordinary things here. We get anti-parallel velocity shear in the region of the arc. And we also get electric field traveling outward from the region of the arc. The arc goes something like this. And you know, this is this is very compelling right here. Um, I 
Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to look at the dual heating in the region of these discrete arcs. Uh, dual heating is described by the current dotted with the electric field, and I decided to give an everyday example of this. If one were to think of a current as a flow, one could think of it as water. If water attempted to flow downhill, it would gain energy. If water attempted to flow uphill, it would lose energy. And in the ionosphere, when you try and have these flows, these currents against the electric field, it dissipates in the form of heat. Okay, a little more formally, we're integrating the total heat uh, over a, an area. FOV is field of view, what we're looking at either in the model or in you know, with radar, divided by the field of view integral of the area. Now the heating is equal to the electric field time dotted with the current, which is equal to the electric field dotted with the property here, the conductivity tensor dotted with the electric field. Now since the conductivity tensor, the space is isotropic, in our case that's just a scalar, so we get E. Now as I said earlier, E is equal to V cross V, and since this is perpendicular to this, this is just the conductivity times the magnitude of the magnetic field squared times the velocity squared, which is a bunch of constants. I have to apologize for this and insist on calling this a tangent. That's why I said nothing. And this is, uh, so it's just, it's proportional to the velocity squared. Now, and we're taking averaging over an area. <coughs> Now, this is an important point. Since the velocity is never uniform in one direction, averaging over larger scale sizes will always result in an underestimating dual heating. You have one, er er one flow this way, one flow this way. If you add them up in this direction, they're going to add up destructively. So you're always going to lose some of your, the amount of dual heating you're trying to measure by taking a larger scale size. Okay. Now we did just this, we averaged over, oh, this is still wrong, this is a 1D parallelization. Um, and we fed this the information, here are the processor boundaries. Now the actual grid boundaries between different um, points in the grid was unknown to the processors when this was distributed to work. So they had to calculate whether I have a grid boundary, whether I have a, um, a scale size boundary, without any prior knowledge, collect the whole thing and bring it down, and it worked like a dream. <coughs> nice piece of paper. Okay, some of the results here. Uh, we're looking at the dual heating here. This is just system units. Um, this can be mapped to real values and has been. This is for the space, just system units. And these are alphane times. So this is um, about a tenth of a second, give or take. And we see a couple of things here. Qualitatively, let's deal with this numerical resolution line first. This is the initial plasma motion with the plasma trying to deal with the anti or the non equilibrium situation that's forced in by the magnetic shear. This is the arrival of the alphane wave from the arrival from the top of the simulation cell. And this is the turbulence caused by the mixing from the deposition of this energy from the top of the cell. Now, when you take a look at this, this is numerical resolution, one square kilometer, four square kilometers, 16, 64, and 256 square kilometers. And you can see that you lose a lot as you go up in size, and this implies that there is a great deal of fine scale structure going on. That these, this is not anywhere even approximately in the same direction. Yeah, I'll make a point about how far scale can Okay, now, Earlier I showed you some current sheets. If one integrates along the field lines, one can get a pseudo potential. Uh, I'm told that's important to mention this is not a true potential because it's a non-static case. It's, it's, it time varies. But it does give one a measure of energy of the field lines. So here it is from underneath, looking up, and we're watching the time evolution of the discrete arc. That is just, no, I don't mean to sound too deep, but that is just beautiful. I can stare at that for hours. In fact, I think I have. 
So this is something which looks like an Aurora Corona. Okay, this is how I wanted to close up. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I feel that when we've lost our sense of wonder in science, we've really lost our way. And um, what I'm going to show next uh, is plots done by Jeff Mann, John Gennetti, and Eric Adamson of this simulated aurora using an emission <coughs> routine developed by Dirk Wormerzheim, which I think is in tech notes for the GI. But, um, and it's interspersed with actual pictures of the aurora that I've taken. And uh, this is how I want to close it. That when it gets halfway or so, you might be okay. Put a buffer and play at the same time. How am I doing for time? You're good. You're good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know you have a couple other slides after this, but. Well, uh, oh, by the way, before I forget, this young lady here actually animated these for me, and I'll put it into YouTube. Fire it up again and we'll see if it makes it. Oh, it's so pretty, I don't know that it goes away. Right. Well, you do the boss though, tell me. It'll, it, go ahead and fire it up. I think it'll um, okay. I think it'll manage to keep buffering and playing at the same time. Uh, conclusions made your findings. Uh, the simulation method yielded a quantitative and even semi-quantitative description of formation and time eleven through evolution of discrete world arcs, including uh, the narrowness of arcs, uh, the E field perpendicular from arcs, anti-parallel velocity shear, and the region of arcs, 
Uh, we also reproduced realistic ionospheric conductivities. Uh, dual heating, we looked at, we found, I didn't show this, but we found a pink peak, peak linear with shear rate. This is a fully reasonable result because the shear rate is a direct measure of the amount of energy inputted into the system in the form of point and flux. Uh, the predicted underrepresentation of the literature, at least the time, was a factor of eight. We found, or two, and we found as much as eight. Now, to go to, um, to go to, to adequately resolve this, one would have to go to approximately 0.1 kilometer spatial resolution and one outfane time, and this should be 0 0.1 seconds, not 1.1 to resolve. Um, next steps and remaining open questions, okay. Uh, the mechanism for which increased ionospheric conductivity is more likely to shut off magnetic reconnection, thus causing the loss of the properties of the aurora. If we cranked up the conductivity, we would lose the magnetic reconnection, the shear would be eroded by the, the, the shear would be eroded at the bottom of the, of the simulation domain. Um, and this would eventually become so marked that there wouldn't be enough magnetic shear to maintain the reconnection region when we shut off and we lose the properties of real world. And it's not clear why increased ionospheric conductivity would cause this. And it points to the fact that our ex the description of this is possibly not complete. Uh, and it's not no clear. Oh, not clear why there is less turbulence for the boundary conditions B case, possibly because of consequence of choosing too low an altitude to make the measurements. And also another approach could be to integrate over the um, the bottom part of the ionosphere to get a more accurate picture of the And thank you. Doing, we're doing pretty well just where we wanted to be on time. We have uh, allocated time for questions from any of the people that joined us today. So it wasn't actually clear totally to me what an elfin wave is. Is that what you see when you look at an aurora, the, the, no, the waving? Or? They're invisible to the eye. Uh, an alphane wave is if one disturbs a magnetic field line, which is a mathematical abstraction. You can't really see a magnetic field line. But if one disturbs a magnetic field line, it will resonate like a plucked guitar string. And if you do this in the presence of charged particles which can move around, it'll act like a gel slowing down both the speed the speed at which it travels. And that's a simplified picture of an alphane wave. So does it then affect what we see in an aurora? Massively. I, I had to choose what I showed today and what I couldn't, and we mapped the alphane waves from the reconnection region all the way down to the bottom of the ionosphere, and it spread the current, it spread the discrete auroral phase, and it, um, it, it spread the discrete arc. Yeah, it, it, it uh, totally affects what you see with your eyes, but what you see with your eyes is actually the optical emission that's as a result of charged particles crashing into other atoms, kicking them up to exciting states and then having them drop down again. Sure. So that's what you get your red and your green and you can talk about, I'm getting beyond. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hard questions are okay? Easy questions are okay? Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. We're, fi we're fine with that. So the, um, as I said in the agenda, the, uh, the next phase will just be the executive uh, session with the committee when we get back some hard questions. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank very much the public for, uh, for joining us. And um, I hope you all will join me in congratulating Ron for uh, getting to this phase of his career here at UAF. John. Right. Um. <laughs> oh dear. That's <laughs> both great and terrible at the same time. Yes. Uh, what is it? Uh, defense. Defense. Oh. oh, defense. Oh, I get it. Have you been to a football game? No. Actually, I, uh, I was at Chapel Hill in uh, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> <laughs>